This week on Jerusalem Dateline, the unrest about the Temple Mount continues, but what's behind the violence? The match that ignites the people and brings them to the streets and causes violence is this libel. al is in danger and this is baseless. Plus, an Iranian Christian fights for her freedom and for her life and a look back on how history and prophecy came together during the 1967 Six-Day War and how to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell, coming to you this week from just outside the walls of the Old City. The unrest around the Temple Mount continues. Here's CBN News' Julie Stahl with an update. Israeli police were on highest alert for Friday prayers on the Temple Mount. Because of the threat of violence, they limited entry to the site to men over 50 and all women. Prayers passed relatively peacefully, as they did last week. Later, clashes broke out in Palestinian areas outside Jerusalem, as they did the previous week. On Thursday, the Muslim Waqf told all Muslims they could return to pray on the Temple Mount. But nearly 100 Palestinians were wounded when they started rioting in the old city after Israel removed all the metal detectors and security cameras it had installed. Trouble started on July 14th when three Israeli Arabs killed two Israeli policemen in a terror attack with weapons they had stored on the Temple Mount. The terrorists were subsequently killed on the Temple Mount compound. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. Many Palestinian protests revolve around one main issue. The Al-Aqsa Mosque on the Temple Mount is in danger. Just a rumor about Israel undermining the site can send Muslims around the world into a frenzy. It's a dishonest tactic aimed at not only undermining Israel, but Judeo-Christian values as well. It's one of the most holy and contested pieces of real estate on earth, the Temple Mount. For decades, Islamic leaders have incited Muslims to violence by telling them that the Al-Aqsa Mosque is in danger. First, they claim that the Israelis were undermining its foundations to make it collapse. Now they also say it's a threat even for Jews to pray on the sacred plateau. Extreme uh, uh, movements believe that Israel is planning to build the third temple and to uh, destroy their holy shrine. Known in Arabic as the Haram al-Sharif, or Noble Sanctuary, it's the place where two consecutive Jewish temples once stood. The second was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans. Now, Muslim mosques occupy the site. The Golden Dome of the Rock to my right is the most identifiable Muslim shrine on the Temple Mount. But it's the gray-domed Al-Aqsa Mosque to my left that Muslims consider the third holiest site in Islam. They believe that Muhammad took a famous night ride from Mecca to Al-Aqsa on his winged horse, Al-Barak. Al-Aqsa was first built in 705 AD. In Muslim theology, the site precedes the Jews and goes back to creation. You know, Adam, when he descended from the heaven, he came here and he was pray here. No, no different between uh, Suleiman and King David and all the prophets, it's all the same. They've all been in Al-Aqsa Mosque. Today, the entire plateau is referred to as Al-Aqsa. Nadav Shragai wrote the Al-Aqsa is in danger libel, the history of a lie. He says when Muslim leaders want to unite the masses, they claim it's in danger. The match that ignites the people and brings them to the streets and causes violence is this libel. al is in danger and this is baseless. Archaeologist Dr. Gabriel Barkai says there have been excavations near the Temple Mount, but never under it. One of the cornerstones of Western civilization was never touched by the spade of the archaeologist. Barkai says it was Muslims, not Jews, who began digging in an attempt to rewrite history. Since the 90s, there were many uh, destructive diggings going on in the Temple Mount, which were not for archaeological purposes, but the contrary, for destroying archaeological data. Around 2000, the Islamic religious authorities dug up thousands of years of history with bulldozers from under the Temple Mount to make room for a giant mosque. Barkai headed an operation to save artifacts from the discarded material. Years later, archaeologists and volunteers still sift through the debris. 
According to Shragai, then Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Hajj Amin al-Husseini started the libel against Israel in the 1930s. He accused the Jews of wanting to collapse the mosques on the Temple Mount. That led to Muslim rioting and murder of the Jews, just the first of many incidents. Islamic expert Dr. Yitzhak Reiter says the tactic hasn't lost its potency. They really believe in what they think, that Al-Aqsa is in danger as long as Israel is controlling the eastern part of East Jerusalem. In 1969, the Muslim world blamed Israel for the arson attack on the Al-Aqsa Mosque by a visiting Australian Christian. That lie continues today. More trouble in 1996. The worst Israeli-Palestinian violence in 30 years broke out when Israel opened an exit for visitors to the Western Wall Tunnels half a mile from Al-Aqsa. And in 2004, rain, snow, and a minor earthquake toppled the entrance ramp to the Temple Mount. That provoked an international Islamic uproar when Israel tried to rebuild it. We asked Muslims in Jerusalem what they think. It's in danger. To destroy him, to took the place, it's in danger. They are digging underneath it and digging and digging and they don't find anything. God will save it. <laughs> Recently, Israel arrested a key Islamic figure for incitement. He told his followers Israel planned to break into the Temple Mount and they should use their bodies to prevent Jews from going up there. Experts say it's important the West takes notice now because millions of Muslims believe the lie is true. They say if it brought violence in the past, it will do so in the future. The Palestinian Authority just increased their budget to pay convicted terrorists and their families. And the move comes despite U.S. pressure to end the practice. On Friday, July 21st, 19-year-old Omar al-Abed entered this home and murdered 70-year-old Yosef Solomon and his two grown children. These pictures showed the brutality of the murders. The home was open, the door was unlocked because they were waiting for people from the community to come and celebrate with them the birth of this new grandchild. And within seconds, they were murdered in their own homes. After the murders, Abed was shot and is now recovering in an Israeli hospital. But according to a long-standing policy by the Palestinian Authority, he'll now start receiving a salary from Friday, from the day that he was arrested, and he will get a life sentence for murder, and his salary eventually is going to reach 12,000 shekel, which is uh, about uh, in the area of 4,000 U.S. dollars a month. The U.S. and the European Union condemn this practice and have pressured the Palestinian leadership to stop. But according to Itamar Marcus of the Palestinian Media Watch, their funding has increased. In their 2017 budget, the PA increased spending to terrorist prisoners by 13 percent and by 4 percent to their families. This year, direct funding of terrorism has reached $355 million. There's a slap in the face to the United States. There's a slap in the face to the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Senate that just met last week uh, to decide what to do about this. Um, and I'm hoping that the, the Senate and the American people and the, and the Congress and the administration uh, will act very firmly on this reward to terror. The U.S. Senate is now considering legislation named after Taylor Force, a U.S. citizen killed by a Palestinian terrorist to defund the Palestinian Authority if they continue to pay terrorists and their families. Senator Lindsey Graham told CBN News... We're going to keep that aid flowing with one condition. The Secretary of State has to certify that the Palestinian government is changing their behavior. If he can't do that, we'll cut that money off. Marcus says the PA legitimizes these payments. And people don't understand why, and I'll explain why this is so important. The Palestinian Authority claims to its people that they have a right to kill Israelis. Literally, a right to kill Israeli civilians, a right to kill women, children, babies. And they claim that a UN decision from the 1970s, which said that the Palestinians have the right um, to use all means to gain their rights, uh, means they have a right to kill civilians. This is the way the Palestinian Authority interprets it, and they said it numerous times, even in the last few months. Marcus argues passing the Taylor Force Act would send a powerful message to the PA that the United States rejects that kind of thinking. Up next, ISIS may be gone from Mosul and other Iraqi cities, but what will happen to the Christians?
Although the United States and other coalition partners have driven ISIS away from Iraqi cities like Mosul, the task of rebuilding remains enormous. But the question for others is, what will become of the persecuted Christians? These are the sights of victory. People dancing and waving flags in the streets. And these are the sounds. Commanders declaring historic success against ISIS. Over the last three years, through Iraqi determination, ISIS has been on an increasingly rapid decline, losing Tikrit, Ramadi, Fallujah, and now Mosul. Iraqi security forces, on the other hand, have only improved and gotten stronger. This victory today, it's not a victory of Iraqi people. This is an a victory for the whole world, a world that suffered from the acts of these terrorists everywhere. And the suffering remains, as you can see from this drone footage of Mosul's old city. It shows widespread devastation on a massive scale, buildings reduced to rubble and smoke from occasional airstrikes still rising into the sky. We were over there back in April, and what we saw was that, uh, you know, the Sunnis, ISIS, went through and spray painted each home. And they said this is either a Sunni home, a Shia home, or a Christian home. And if it was Shia or if it was Christian, the place they put a barrel of oil in it and lit it on fire. And you can imagine what that does to a structure. Jeff King is the president of International Christian Concern, a nonprofit organization which acts as a bridge between believers in free countries and those in persecuted countries. Just back from Iraq, King says rebuilding and giving viability to the people of Iraq will be far beyond the capabilities of the Iraqi government especially for the thousands of Christians and other religious minority leaders who were forced from their homes due to ISIS, many with only the clothes on their backs. His team took these pictures, images of Jesus used as target practice by ISIS fighters. In another church, the statue of Mary shot up to where only pieces of her face remained. We saw these images over and over. Generally, the idea is to desecrate. They want to push the Christians out. If they're not going to convert to Islam, they want them out of the country. They want them out of the area. King says much of the U.S. aid is channeled away from Christians once it gets to Iraq due to the dominant Muslim religion. So his organization works with Capitol Hill lawmakers to specifically help Christians in the war-torn region. He says statistics show that of the 1.5 million Christians calling Iraq home in 2003, only about 250,000 remain. King told us the majority of Christians his workers spoke with want to come back. They just need the new government of Iraq to protect them. When that help comes, when that touch comes, they praise God like crazy. And they say, my gosh, we're part of something so big. A family doing God's work here on earth, supporting each other. Eric Rosales, CBN News, Washington. Coming up, an Iranian Christian in Sweden fights for her freedom and maybe even her life. After allowing in more migrants than all of Europe combined in the past few years, Sweden has yanked the welcome mat. And now Christians are being sent back to their home nations to face certain torture and even death in Muslim nations. CBN's Dale Hurd reports on one such case from Sweden. Sweden is about to deport Iranian Christian actress Aydin Stranson back to the Islamic Republic of Iran where she faces torture, rape, and even death in an Iranian prison. But as Swedish officials have told Aydin, becoming a Christian was her decision. And now it's her problem, and not theirs. This from a nation that thinks of itself as one of the most humane countries in the world. After all, Sweden is the humanitarian superpower, which welcomed refugees with open arms, until the government took too much political heat and decided some have to go whether it kills them or not. Sweden's migration board even violates its own stated principles that it will never deport asylum seekers to a nation where they will be harmed. The migration board has on its home page information about uh, each country. And in the information regarding Iran, there are plenty of reports stating that it is standard to torture and to rape in Iranian prisons. And the question we have been asking the migration board time and time again is, why are you putting this information on your home page if you don't follow it? Swedish attorney Gabriel Donner has assisted an estimated 1,000 Christian asylum seekers facing deportation. Do you think in Aydin's case they, they think she's lying? 
or they just don't care? Primarily, we don't care. It's numbers. They have promised the public in Sweden that they will deport more people than before. And so they have to fill the quota. Eideen Stransson came to Sweden in 2014 on a work visa and adopted a Swedish last name. She had starred in films and a TV series in Iran, making her an even bigger target if she is sent back. She says she came to Christ in Iran after seeing video of Muslims stoning a woman to death. And I decided that uh, that moment I don't want to be Muslim anymore. In Iran, where it can be deadly to convert to Christianity, Aydin kept her conversion largely a secret. But when she came to Sweden, she requested a public baptism. I want to have it baptized in a public because I want to say I don't afraid anymore. Iranian intelligence most likely knows too. She's already gotten threats from Muslims on social media. Article 33 of the Geneva Convention on Refugees, which Sweden signed, prohibits nations from deporting asylum seekers back to their home countries if they face danger. But that hasn't stopped Sweden. Donner estimates there are 8,000 Christian asylum seekers hiding in Sweden because they're under deportation orders. He says part of the problem is that migration officials don't understand why someone would become a Christian. And they don't understand what it means to be a Christian. Less than 20% of Swedes say they believe in God. This is most apparent when they come to the question when a convert says, I converted because of the love I have received from Jesus Christ. And they almost mockingly ask the convert, what do you mean by love? They don't understand the message in the Bible. It's just completely alien to them. The Swedish Migration Board's press officer told us if the person has well-founded reasons to fear persecution due to religious beliefs, he or she will be granted asylum in Sweden. But Aydin's asylum request has been rejected, and her case has been turned over to border police. At her hearing, a Swedish migration official told her it wouldn't be as bad for her in Iran as she expected, because she would only have to spend about six months in prison. Donner told us of a similar case where an Iranian woman was imprisoned for becoming a Christian. After her release, she was silent. She did not tell what had happened. After six weeks, she threw herself out from a window on the fourth floor and killed herself. But stories like that may not stop Aydin's deportation. Six months as a woman in a prison is not, no problem. No. They don't care. No, they don't care about it. Dale Hurd, CBN News, Stockholm. Up next, an historic victory and prophecy fulfilled in How to Pray for Israel. On the eve of the 1967 Six-Day War, Jews around the world were terrified that their newly born country was about to be destroyed. But as Scott Ross reports, no one could have imagined the victory that was in store for Israel and how history and prophecy would come together to deliver an amazing victory. I was writing a chemistry exam in my junior high in Montreal, Canada. I snuck in a transistor radio to the exam room. I was listening because we were frustrated and frightened. More than 5,000 miles from Israel, Jewish teenager Moishe Kempinski was feeling the shock waves of the Six-Day War. The world told us the next Holocaust was going to happen. Tel Aviv and Haifa were digging up mass graves. We expected the worst. Then something very different happened. On June 6, something miraculous happened that we really weren't aware of. The, the most powerful Arab army in the Middle East was the Jordanian Legion. British armed, British trained. They were in charge of the old city. And for some reason, till this day, no one knows why, they just picked up and left. On the third day, Israel captured the old city. So on my transistor radio, I was listening to a broadcast of a broadcaster, a correspondent running with the forces. He's then Rabbi Gorin decides to blow a shofar, a ram's horn, thousands of kilometers away, blowing a shofar. The sounds goes across the radio waves. I knew at that moment, no matter what would happen, I would become a Jerusalemite. Author and shop owner Kempinski moved to Israel more than 30 years ago. How has it changed your life? I mean, that's a pretty loaded question. Not really. It's when I finally realized I'm not 
reading the Bible anymore. I'm not studying the Bible. I just became the Bible. When you realize that you're walking here is a fulfillment of prophecy. My child playing in the park 31, 30 years ago, and I realized, you know what, maybe my son Yoni was the one that Zachariah saw in his vision when he says in Zechariah 8, there will yet be time when old men and old women rest on the streets and children will play in the streets of Jerusalem. Do young people today appreciate that? You're, you have what, six children? Six children. All served in the military? All served in the military and all of them very much appreciate it. Uh, in addition to that, it gave them the eyes to see everything in its real context. Construction booms, cranes that you see all over the country, you suddenly realize they aren't construction cranes. They're the words of Amos 9 being made physical. I will rebuild your ruins. How is God going to fulfill prophecy if not through construction cranes? When you realize that, that every physical thing you see, every brick you see, every building you see being built is actually God speaking to the world saying, wake up. I'm doing what I said I would do. Are you going to be part of this plan or are you going to fight it? And for the future? I think what is going to happen is there's going to be more negativity and there's going to be more people realizing God's on the move. And everything but everything is possible. Scott Ross for CBN News in Jerusalem. That victory was 50 years ago. But now with all the chaos surrounding Jerusalem, many wonder how to pray for Israel. Here's one answer. I'd like to ask the listening audience to pray on a regular basis for the peace of Jerusalem because Jerusalem is the epicenter of the universe in the mind of God. Mm -hmm. Not mine, not America's, not Russia's, but in the mind of God, Jerusalem is the epicenter. It is the place where Abraham placed Isaac on the altar. It is the place where the first temple and the second temple were built. It is the place where Jesus Christ is going to sit on the throne of his father King David and rule the world. There is a supernatural war right now that is waging and is soon going to rupture into a literal warfare over the peace of Jerusalem. The prince of darkness wants that for the Antichrist. The king of kings wants that for King Jesus. So when you're praying for peace in Jerusalem, you're praying for the peace of the world, but you're also praying for the sovereign will of God to defend the Jewish people and to defend the state of Israel. Please continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And that video was an example of what you can see on our Facebook page. So check us out. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Thanks for joining us. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.